If brutal hypothermia started ravaging your mind and body while you were stranded with your friends at an isolated mountain cabin, what would you do? It's almost that time of year again when the northern hemisphere starts giving the sun the silent treatment, throws a frigid white blanket over itself, and tells warmth and joy to step off until spring. Most of us will be hibernating, eating industrial-sized bags of Cheetos, and drinking alcoholic eggnog. But for those of you who don't take one look at all that frozen white bullshit and go back to bed, it means you'll be playing chicken with death. The kind of death that creeps up on you like a coward and turns your own mind against you. I don't know about you, but I refuse to die from a cold. I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat this snow sickness in snowfall. It's New Year's Eve. Andy, M, River, Eden, and Kit are normal people doing normal things. Like gathering all the booze that they can fit in one car and driving up into the mountains to a cabin that belongs to River's parents for the weekend. They build a snowman, drink like there's no tomorrow, and break in that nice deck jacuzzi properly. Eden gets in some med school studying like a nerd. M, hypochondriacs all over everyone, and they all zoom the one member of their friend group who couldn't make it. A guy named Jace, who loves these people way more than their actual families do. Aside from a warning from River's dad not to wreck the place or spill anything, they're basically left to their own devices. Well, not devices. There's barely any cell service, and the Wi-Fi only lasts a single night before a sudden blizzard knocks out their power. But not before they watch the ball drop, and Kit makes them all alcoholic snow cones. M wonders if it's sanitary to eat the snow. Well, so long as it's not yellow or black, I think you're fine. The radio kicks on with a weather warning. The popular ski resort area of Snowfalls is about to be hit by two storms and a bomb cyclone. Basically, a swirling air mass caused by a rapid drop in air pressure. In summer, these bring torrents of rain. In winter, a blizzard. Right on cue, the power dies. River checks the backup generator, but there's no gas. So, he tells everyone they'll sleep in the living room by the fire, and if they need to, wedge towels under the doors. Oh, I thought he was gonna say spoon each other. Well, that makes sense. Fireplaces typically only heat the room that they're in, so if that's all we have, well, we're all getting cozy by the fire. But if you're ever in a building this size with an open floor plan like this, you're gonna lose a lot of the heat to just basic architecture, especially with that giant window directly across from the fireplace. Look for blankets and nails. Tell River to get over it and tack up blankets across the room's entrances and windows to minimize heat loss. It'll turn this room into an oven, which will both keep us warm and prevent us from blazing through the limited firewood that we do have. No joke, this is the most immediate, easy way to beat this situation. And I'm bringing it up early because, well, they're on the clock even though they don't know it yet. They need to handle their situation now, before things get worse. Not many of you you know this, but I have a side hustle. Selling space cruisers to intergalactic tours in Star Trek Fleet Command. Star Trek Fleet Command is a free-to-play MMO open-world game set in the expansive Star Trek universe. You can explore the vast landscape of space freely in the Kelvin timeline while stepping into the shoes of your favorite Starfleet officers like Captain Kirk, Spock, Data, Geordi, or Scotty. Command legendary vessels equipped with transports and replicas Applicators, or build and customize them yourself. Engage in epic battles with other players, forge alliances, and explore new worlds for basically ever. I went straight Klingon, built myself a bird of prey, and dominated my sector of the galaxy. And like I said, the game is free, with new content, events, and surprises coming out every month, evolving the gameplay experience while you're playing it. Right now, Star Trek Fleet Command is celebrating its fifth year anniversary by giving new players a content pack that includes 10 epic shards of Kirk, which hold the power of Captain James T. Kirk and provide amazing defensive stats and strong buffs to your ship. This pack comes free for new users with the promo code WARPSPEED. Once you've downloaded the game using the link in my description, go to your player profile settings, choose General, and scroll down to the very end to sign up for the Scopely account. Then go to StarTrekFleetCommand.com, click the store icon, and access promo codes on the left-hand menu. Enter your code to reap the rewards today. Try out the game. Just be sure to redeem the code WARSPEED before reaching level 10. Big shout out to Star Trek Fleet Command for helping to keep me in the how to be business. The next morning, Andy walks a mile looking for cell service and doesn't find any. River tells them they'll have to ration firewood because there's not much in reserve. So, it'd be easy to shit all over them for being unprepared. But it's not like we live in Mad Max. Blizzard
blizzard rush. The storm came on without a warning. Any of us could get stuck somewhere without backup power and only the wood we brought with us for warmth. Having said that, now's probably a good time to start. Uh, I don't know, proactively improving our odds using this revolutionary new technology called chopping wood. I know, I know, practically Da Vinci over here, coming up with these radical new ideas. Most people chop firewood in the late winter, early spring to give the wood an entire year to dry out before winter comes. That doesn't mean you can't chop more in the winter, it's just harder. In a bit, we'll see that they have an ax. So, while we have full stomachs, we should be hacking at the woods like they owe us money. Especially if River doesn't want us axing his parents' antiques when it gets too cold. If chopping actual trees is too hard, you can cut off branches instead. There's no time to waste. They need to do this now, like right now. By the end of the first day, they start talking about siphoning gas from the car to run the generator. But that would mean they won't be able to use the car when the roads are clear. Eden warns them drinking alcohol will only make them cold which is true, and them and Andy take off their clothes and cuddle to keep warm. They run out of firewood on the second day and have to start rationing food. Kit and Andy walk as far as they can, but the roads are snowed in. Andy suggests they break up pieces of furniture for firewood, but River won't hear of it. He promised his family he wouldn't wreck anything in the house. Not a good sign that the only thing keeping you alive is already out of fuel by day two. Again, easily fixed with that axe that they have. But if the literal forest outside your doorstep isn't gonna cut it, you gotta start hacking away at this house. Staying in a giant wooden lodge, slowly dying of hypothermia, is like being on a deserted island surrounded by water you can't drink. Except, it's nothing like that, because the option exists to fix your situation immediately. You dumb- the wood inside is also probably better, considering it's already dry. They need to start disassembling Ikea's finest, like right now. I mean, I wouldn't want to breathe it in, but we kind of don't have a choice. Their big problem is the silent killer already among them, hypothermia, which is basically your body losing heat faster than it can produce heat. You start shivering and slurring your speech. You're confused. Your memory goes, and you get sleepy. That's the early stages of the illness. The real danger comes when you stop shivering. Your core temp drops below 90 and you begin to hallucinate. Once that happens, you enter the I can't trust anything I see phase of the illness, where you can't help yourself or anyone else. You may be saying to yourself, yeah, but it's only been a few hours. They can wait a while before they start their shining reenactment. You'd be wrong and dead. Depending on the temp and your shelter situation, hypothermia can set in in as little as five minutes. No, really five minutes. Now, these people are inside. They've layered up, they're sitting by a fire, and they're trying to stay warm, so the cold is seeping in much slower than it would if one of them jumped into an icy river or something. But it's coming for them every second of every minute that they're sitting here. Eden tells them they have to do two things to survive this, stay warm and stay awake, worried that if someone goes to sleep, they'll die of hypothermia. She's not wrong. Staying warm is obvious, and she suggests one easy and clever way to conserve heat immediately by using hot water bottles at their feet to help keep their core temp up. That's super easy to do here because they have natural gas coming through the stove, which means they can constantly heat the water to refill those bottles. It's not as good as a fire or, you know, the power being on, but it'll work. However, staying awake can also be dangerous. Even going 24 hours without sleep can cause slurred speech, reduced reaction time, slow thinking, and eventually hallucinations. Yeah, I don't need a snow demon torturing my freezing before I go into cardiac arrest. We're gonna keep this place warm and just avoid all of that. Turn this room into a blanket fort. Start making a mental list of everything of lesser value in the house that can be burned. Chairs, window blinds, boxes in the attic. Not everything in here is an antique. I'm sure River's rich parents can replace kitchen cabinet doors. I'm also pretty sure they wouldn't want a bunch of dead bodies in their house. Instead, they pop Kit's Adderall pills to stay awake and the mental gymnastics begin. Kit feels the effects of hypothermia mixed with sleep deprivation first. He lights the gas stove to warm his hands, then he lets the intrusive thoughts win. A little later, River starts to wonder if the snow itself is contaminated with something, and points out that they ate it too, and the paranoia sets in. River gets up to look outside and hallucinates the snowman coming to get him. 
This is the make or break Frostpunk moment. They need to take drastic measures before they lose their mental clarity for good and all hope is lost. Restore your source of heat or decline. The next day, Andy notices M is missing. It's so cold in the house, they didn't even notice that the door is wide open and M is outside. Em! Her clothing's damp, her heart's racing. Eden warns that M could go into cardiac arrest if they don't slowly raise her temperature. They get her under covers on the couch, only for River to tell them he feels sick and he's worried something evil is in the snow. Eden and Andy huddle with Kit, worried about their friends. Eden says it's the start of mass hysteria, a fear that they're collectively feeding on and panicking about. She says that it means they'll need to do something more drastic, going back to the idea of siphoning gas from the car and using using it to power the generator, even if it means they'll be stuck later. Or we start burning furniture. Even if they had a full tank of gas, which they don't, it would only run a house generator for between 8 and 12 hours. Grandma's knickknacks, on the other hand, will keep us warm for the rest of our lives. River offers to siphon the gas himself, but even though they just talked about him acting strange, they let him do it on his own. When he doesn't return, Andy catches River sabotaging everything. <laughs> What the hell are you doing? Furniture bonfire it is. Tie Captain Paranoia to a chair before you do it too, just to make sure he can't interfere again. Not to go full oversimplified here, but a lot of this behavior matches accounts from the doomed Donner party of 1846. Freezing temps, erratic behavior, mania, and eventually cannibalism. It got so bad that even when the rescue was literally standing in front of them, people didn't believe that they were saved and continued to kill each other. Lack of sleep, cold, hunger, they do things to our brains. The only way we survive here is to act before we reach the tipping point of insanity. It's too late for M. While they're handling the river situation, M locks herself in the bathroom and hallucinates. <laughs> She becomes convinced that the snow has infected her and tries to cut it out before Andy can break down the door. Anybody else having flashbacks to that horse scene from The Revenant? Eden goes to grab a first aid kit to sew M up and discovers River's been hoarding food while the rest of them go hungry. That would be strike three. Time to tie this dude to a chair before he can harm anybody else. It's for his own good too. Andy takes the ax to a coffee table in the living room to build a new fire, but River intervenes. Unfortunately, Andy's not entirely there himself and he gets distracted at the wrong moment. <laughs> And it's a hard TKO for the big guy. River can't believe what he's done. M almost takes a swing at him. And nobody gets back to chopping up that god coffee table. Guys, it's what Andy would have wanted. He didn't hear her phone ringing. It's Jace who tells her he called for rescue when he didn't hear from them. Not River's parents, the actual owners of the house, or any of the other parents. This random dude who flaked on them. I'm cold. Unfortunately, she's left to think it's a hallucination when the call freaks and Kit says the phone is dead. By the next day, they still haven't built a new fire. And they've all started hallucinating, which means they're all at the mercy of fickle mortality now. Kit says he'll walk until he can find help, but he finds some waiting in the closet for him. Despite that hallucination, they still let him leave because they're all too far gone for self-diagnosis. M holds it together until nightfall when she hallucinates that Andy is still alive, telling her to leave without her coat or her friends. She steals the keys, turns on the car, and freezes to death in the night. Cool. In the morning, Eden and River decide to go after Kit, even though it's snowing again and he left an entire day ago. Yeah, this is a great way to lose his trail almost immediately and wander until a wind to go makes an easy meal out of you. Kit didn't make it too far anyway. They find his naked body just past side of the house. Eden tells River it's called paradoxical undressing, a severe hypothermic response where a freezing person becomes so convinced that they're hot that they strip off all their clothes and freeze to death faster. River finally agrees to start breaking antiques, but it's too late. He hallucinates Eden attempting to seduce him with a hot shower. 
Of course, the water isn't hot, and the real Eden pulls them out, practically seizing with cold. They hear sirens in the distance and sit on the porch waiting for help to arrive, with River still wet and shivering beside her. The police officer asks Eden if there's any other survivors. She says, it's just us. But River isn't really there. He froze to death in the shower upstairs. Well, let's hope this officer brought a thermal foil blanket and has a therapist on speed dial, cause she's gonna need them both. Every single death here was avoidable almost from the beginning. Insulating the room with the fireplace is step one, the most important step that makes everything else possible. Step two is securing a second source of firewood. Forest or furniture makes no difference. With the forest, you might have to leave the sticks to dry a bit longer, but the point is, they had plenty of time before they ran out. With a steady fire keeping them warm in an insulated room, there's practically no danger, just the discomfort of being a bit hungry. If they'd acted early enough, there would have been no need to regulate their sleeping, which means they wouldn't have hallucinated either. Once the hallucinations kicked in, they had a few hours max before they were lost for good. So don't be them. You and I are making it out of this completely fine. Maybe even a little too hot. Snow demons ain't got shit on us. For those reasons, I think Snowfalls was beaten. Moral of the story, you can buy new stuff, but you can't buy a new life.